This case should never have come to trial. I don't think it's fair to call my clients frauds. Because one time I turned into a dog and they helped me. Thank you. Your Honor, we would like to withdraw our plea of not guilty and enter a plea of guilty. This trial is a travesty. It's a travesty of a mockery, of a sham, of a mockery, of a travesty, of two mockeries, of a sham. If we are to have faith in justice, we need only to believe in ourselves. And the truth shall set you free! How do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? Oh, guilty, but with a real good excuse. Well, I think the truth will come forth. You can't handle the truth! Hello, everybody. It's time for more Law Light, brought to you by Foreman Watson Holtry, FWHlegal.com. We are situated today at the two-story white brick edifice, 530 <laughs> Frederick Street, Owensboro, Kentucky. We're in the library studio, and today, it's just PJ and I. Yes. How you doing, man? Like good old times. I'm doing well. You? I'm doing good. Don't feel real well, like physically, just kind of. I was going to say, I heard maybe pneumonia, bronchitis. Okay. And they get wanted to get it before it became anything more serious. And yeah. uh, so, anyhow, I've um, been on, you know, on the steroids, inhaler, and all that stuff. So, yikes. Well, I heard you cough. I think yeah. it was yesterday. <laughs> Don't get me. <laughs> <laughs> just talking about it makes you have to cough. Anyway, but other than not feeling good, I'm doing good. Yeah. So congratulations yeah right we're gonna talk a little bit about that i figured we would we now we can right yeah um, the uh trial it's been in the papers and on the radio stations and things mm-hmm. like that before we do though um i, I want to just i want to thank uh you and john and kenny stone for um covering last week it was a a great episode and then of course no i got to meet kenny myself on sunday for your baptism which was a big day, mm-hmm. and uh, so. Uh, but I appreciate it was a good show, and I got I I, I liked it. I enjoyed it, and I Thank know you. a lot of people listened to it. Well, today is Kenny's birthday, so I wanted oh, to wish Kenny at Kenny. Right. It, uh, and of course, when this comes out, right? yeah, he's he's out of town this week. Well, uh, I wanna I wanted to to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of things. You know, my cousins have become greatly interested in the podcast, and they are itching to uh, know who gets selected as the favorite cousin. Right. However, um, I, my cousin Ernie, the one that Kendall continues to refer to, mm-hmm. very interesting fellow, he heard where we said, well, we, we need to get Ernie on the show. And he said, only if it's a day that we're at Dee's Diner, uh, he would come. <laughs> and so... Like, I don't know if he's, like, ever in Evansville for work because I know that he's all over Indiana. But I also said, well, look, if it doesn't work out soon that you'd be in this region, we, we can remote you in, you know, and yeah. do one. We can always have him call in on one where we're at Dee's Diner. Mm-hmm. Now, he doesn't get the luxury of actually we eating the food. We can tell him all about the food. Yeah, we can tell him how delicious their food is. Well, um, after hearing <laughs> this, we'll find out what his uh, preference is and get uh, Cousin Ernie on the show. My cousins are all very interested in the show. Um, and so, and I know um, I had told them that I had won my trial, but that details about my trial would be on today's podcast. Right. So we'll, we'll get into that. But before we do... Um, I was wondering if you heard about any of the trouble that our friend John got into recently. Bennett? Yeah. No. You didn't Oh, hear? oh. Well, yeah. Oh. Are you talking about his chin? I'm talking about the weekend that beget yeah. the chin. Right. Yeah. Right. I saw that. Yeah. And uh, Did you hear about any of how it went down? He only told me that he had a, a bit too much to drink and he fell down some stairs fell at the bottom of some stairs and hit his chin on a metal dog fence. And so let's uh let's open up the story a little yeah. so that everybody He has an issue with falling. Well, he does. He's fallen out of a chair, but he wasn't yeah. drinking that day, right? No, he I'm pretty sure he was sober. Okay. Yeah. Well, here's 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 <laughs> the way I understood it. John took off with a buddy or two for a golf weekend um, in northern Kentucky, up in the Cincinnati area. I right. guess the deal was they were going to leave on Friday afternoon, get up there, maybe do a little you know socializing on Friday evening, and then golf all day Saturday and all day Sunday. And if I, if any of this is wrong, John can come back on the show next week and and correct me. About I'm sure it. he'll be chomping at the bit but, to get uh, on here and talk about it. So John goes and does. Uh, uh, this trip and apparently Saturday through golfing and maybe having a few adult beverages 
John fails to notify his wife where, where he is and what he's doing or check in with her. And their plans change. And instead of staying there at that country club or where they were supposed to be, they end up at this other country club where there is this event going on, a debutante party or something. I, I don't know exactly. But the, the, he, he, John and his friend were not on the guest list. Got me? Right. And so it's getting late into the evening. And apparently John's wife finds out that John's there because he, she's tracking him on his phone. And she's <laughs> calling that place. And they're like, no, there's no John Bennett here. You know? So, yeah, that, that night he gets home very, very, I guess, early on Sunday morning. He's getting in. Falls down the steps, hits his chin on a, uh, you know, and then wakes up on Sunday morning and his wife is like, "Uh, when are you going to be home? To which John replies, I'm, well, I got to golf all day because it's a part of the plans, you know, and then I'll be home tonight. So I wonder if the bruise on his chin is really from the gate or if it's from uh, his wife saying, uh, uh, you know, administering justice. Anyway, to hear John tell the story, um, I, I, I spoke about it hypothetically to my wife. Mm-hmm. And I was like, just, you know, like, because I'm trying to identify what could I get away with, right? You know, in the event that I did X, Y, and Z, how? And she would have punched you in the mouth. She said, no, also. you would have gotten home. My bags would have been packed. I would have left you with the kids. And I would have been gone and you would have not known where I was and see how it feels. And I was like, well, I don't like that, you know. <laughs> so we, uh, I'm not going to take the chance. Uh, so the right. lesson to be learned is stay in touch with your spouse or your significant other while you are out with friends so that there's no worrying going on. And um, if you're going to drink, don't stay upstairs where you have to come down steps. That's right. the moral of the story, right? Yeah. So, uh, well, what's interesting about that was when I saw John, I guess it was Monday when I saw the bruise on his chin, he was the second person within a week where I asked, what happened to your chin? Because last week when I went and picked up the kids from Trina's house, she had a pretty nasty looking bruise on the bottom of her chin in the same exact spot. It was really bizarre. Now, according to her, she uh, was at somebody's house painting. And when she was walking down, I guess the, the ladder or whatever she was standing on, she missed the step and face planted mm. into, a, into the concrete. Ouch, that hurts. Yeah. But then there was this uh, bit of a rumor going around because of Connor that uh, a friend of hers had gotten at upset with her and punched her in the chin punched her in the mouth or something um did you ever fair, figure out which one yeah it turns out it well according to her she really did fall down and that the other thing was was a joke oh, but yeah. ap- apparently in in both uh stories there's a, there is alleged abuse happening one from a friend one from john's wife but i'm sure we'll have him on the show where he can he can we'll let set john defend straight. himself and we'll <laughs> let him give i i kind of um i, I don't know how many details he wants me to share so but i think john was in some hot water and probably deservedly for, oh okay you know. just did she not know that he was supposed to be that he was going to be gone that long well she knew he was going to be gone but the not contacting and then being somewhere where he wasn't going to be right like kind the, of the, shifted the bougie the, party yeah, the bougie party so how did he get in do you know those details? apparently there was a um, a relative that was there and said, y'all can come on over. Nepotism. And it was at a really fairly distinguished country club up in Cincinnati. So Mm. I, it's just, uh, it's funny hearing John tell the story and, and and so we'll have to get him on. (laughs) Well, let's shift, shift gears. Today's focus is going to be uh, a little legal focused. Mm -hmm. Um, this case was in the news. Um, I, I represented, um, a home builder here in town, uh, well-known in this region. About eight years ago, there was a tragic fire in Muhlenberg County, which is a county over. That fire claimed the lives of eight children and a lady. Um, the family was a family of 11, and so the father uh, survived the fire, right. and one child, age 11, survived the fire. It was a, a horrific tragedy. At the time, the family was living in a house that they were renting from the guy's father. There was immediately an outpouring nationwide uh, to help this guy and his daughter. They were both taken to Vanderbilt, where they were in the um, burn unit, He was in a coma for about a week. He ended up getting out of the hospital on the 13th of February. So, uh, and the daughter stayed in a few more days. While he was still in the hospital, my clients get contacted by the guy's pastor. 
Okay, so the guy that was in the fire, they lost his family. They get contacted. Uh, the, the pastor of their church contacts my clients, uh, two brothers from here in Owensboro. When my guys get contacted, the, 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 the reason is is that, that this guy, this pastor, had also done some drywall work in the past for my clients and said, hey, you know, this is what's going on. Would you guys be willing to come down here, meet with Mr. Watson's cousin, who was also a pastor at a different church, and meet with me and see if there's anything you can do because there's a lot of people down here immediately saying we need to build this guy a house, but we don't trust, we don't know him. Can you come and see what's up? My right. client is a, the company made up of the two brothers, okay? Right. They go down and um, meet with uh, the pastor and then Mr. Watson's cousin. They don't have to hear much. They're, they're like, look, here's what we'll do. This is what we do. We're, we're general contractors. We build houses. We will take care of managing donations of services. We don't want cash. If they want to give cash, they can put the cash in the bank where everybody else is giving cash. But if people want to donate, you know, windows, if they want to donate electrical services, plumbing, whatever, we will organize that. We will manage that. And if there's a shortfall, we will meet it. They leave there saying, thank you. Now we can tell everybody else to stop doing this on Facebook. You know, there was people on Facebook, we're going to build them a house and we're going to take these. Donors. So basically they were able to shut that down. And, and our guys were going to give uh, their services of building a home for this guy. Yeah. So it became messy after that. Really messy. So the fire happened on January the 30th of 2014. Okay. Okay. On February the 25th of 2014, the Mr. Watson gets to meet with my clients, and they meet down in Muhlenberg County, and basically they're like, "Hey, you know, here's what here's what here's what we'd like to do: build build your house, we'll manage it, and that kind of thing." Um, the only thing we ask is that you you know you find a lot. And he goes, "Well, I happen to have a lot," and and so they jump in a truck and they go and they look at this lot. Um, off of, uh, it's a lot off Meeks Lane in Graham, Kentucky. And uh, it was not a, a super great lot, you know, but it was suitable. I mean, they could make it work. So um, they begin working the lot up. They, they start the surveys for where to ha put the house on the lot and positioning it. You know, um, the, there's some dispute as to how it went down about how, what Jago was offering and then the size house it ended up being. But eventually the guy picked out the most expensive four bedroom house that, that, uh, my Naturally. guys were willing to build. Right. Um, and he was supposed to have a lot. Well, um, now real quick was the building of this house. Was it going to be like, I mean, who was paying for that part? They're, they're, they're okay, them being the, involved. Okay. So, um, I know other people were donating their services, like you said, electrical. They were going to try to find all that out. But who was paying for everything, ultimately? Was it? Well, if, the, you, there, if there was a shortfall, my client was going to pay it. Okay. But the, the idea was, is my client builds 300 houses a year. At the time, it wouldn't have been that many. But, but they have relationships with what's called trade partners. Okay? Right. You know, they have people that do all their framing. They have two or three framers that frame all their houses. They have... You know, roofers, they have like five or six roofing companies that roof all their houses. They have four or five plumbing companies. And so they have, they've been with some of these people for 30 or 40 years. All right. So they have great relationships with them. They're, they're, they, what they had envisioned was first going to those people and saying, Hey, will you do the foundation? Will you do the brickwork? Will you do the roofing? Will you do the plumbing? Will you do? And then if those people didn't want to do it as a donation, right? They would go to other people that were calling in saying, hey, I can do landscaping, right? You know, and they would they would go to those people. And then if they, between the two, they didn't, then they would pay for it themselves to get it done. Okay. okay. My client starts working on the lot that this guy says, well, there become some issues with the, that. Number one, he never shows them a deed. Number two, he never gets them an address and he fails to tell them that he bought the lot next door to it that already had a house on it with cash donations. Okay. So I want, want to make sure that's very straight is that between the months of March, April, and May of 2014, my guys are sending crews down to clear this lot, to prepare for the septic tank, to prepare for water. They're clearing trees. They are meeting with uh, public officials to make sure that everything's going. 
And the, the Mr. Watson never does furnish them a deed or an address on the house. In the meantime, he buys a 17 acre lot right next to this lot. And it has a house and a barn on it, but he never tells my guys. Okay. And he also buys another lot out there. And so my, my guys have no idea that all that's going on. They're, they're focused on this one lot, the only lot they know about. Let's put that part of the case on hold. There's also this development. And to, to establish this development, I got to go back in time. Mr. Watson's uh, deceased wife is a lady named Nikki. Okay. And Nikki was married to Chad and begat him nine children while they were in college at Mid-Continent University, which is no longer a thing. It was in um, Mayfield, Kentucky. Chad Watson and Nikki had a friend named Alicia Jordan. Okay. And Alicia, uh, they were just, they were just good college friends, best of friends. Well, Alicia and Nikki stay in touch over the years and are just remain very close. When this fire happened, Alicia goes to goes to Vanderbilt and begins to visit Chad and and the daughter. Believe what you want, whether you want to judge them or not. On April the first, which was sixty days after the fire, Chad marries Alicia. Hmm. It was done in secret. They had gotten the marriage certificate or marriage license from McCracken County, which is Paducah. And they didn't tell anybody. They had their cousin, Adam Brown, who was the pastor I told you about was in early meetings, marry him in his house in a fairly secret wedding. Apparently, moments after the wedding, they said, April Fool's is just a joke. Why they did that, probably because they knew they shouldn't be getting married. But nevertheless, they did. They said April Fool's. They were saying that the marriage was just a joke? Just a joke, a hoax. Even though technically, by law, they were now married? They're, they're married, right. So on the 17th, oh, a news okay. article breaks. The 17th of April, the news article breaks, okay? And the news article simply says Mr. Watson had applied for a marriage license in McCracken County and that, that they were married. And they interview the cousin, Adam Brown. In that interview, Adam Brown says, no, um, no, they weren't married. His justification for telling the press that he wasn't, that they weren't married was that they had told him it was an April Fool's joke. But they never undid the marriage because once the family kind of got accustomed to the fact that they had said they were married, they said, okay, well, then we're married. This, that, this is the testimony at trial. This is exactly how the testimony That is at trial. really bizarre. Right. Well, when this starts getting out, and there were a lot of um, people in Muhlenberg County that were very mad, obviously. And, and then I'm not going to get into this part of it, but there were accusations that he had had something to do with the fire, that, that he was having an affair, that, um, you know, and, and I, I can't speak to the truth nor the lack of truth there because that was right. not the focus of our case. There was an investigation that did not, you know, to this date, did not say that he had anything to do with fire. But anyhow, he marries her, and because of the backlash, he was getting death threats. It was in at the time, at the time, topics was a big thing, and it was all <laughs> I over, remember topics. all over topics and you know social media. Yeah, it becomes so bad that they call my clients at the first of June of 2014, and they say, "Look, we're moving, walking away from that lot that you've done all that work on." We're leaving. They, you know, is this deal still on? And my clients, they were admittedly paused by the fact that here we've done all this work and you're leaving. They were, they were a bit taken back by the marriage and how it all went down. But they're good people. And they said, yeah, look, just find a lot. If you find a lot that's suitable, let us look at it and we'll, we'll still go through with this. Right. Real quick questions that are popping up sure. in my head as we're going and I gotta along. make sure I mean there's a couple things number one the case could still be appealed we won the trial with a verdict and so it could be appealed still right um but but it's in, it's been in the papers right. and all that so. I mean one were people upset about the marriage because it was the assumption or the conspiracy theories that he had something to do with the death of his children and wife that's right. that's where all that was stemming from that, right that he was guilty of that Okay. Um, I mean, I or guess, that he had an affair beforehand, nothing to do with the fire. And then it just so happens that it worked out that right, way. Right. But he's getting death threats from just what ran completely random people or all, people that knew his wife and all that. Muhlenberg County people. Oh, okay. Was this whole thing done in secret, the marriage and all that too? Could it have affected 
the building of this home. I mean, I know like if he gets married to this woman, she's probably got a home, right? Right. So, yeah, it was, and then the the purchasing of the of this other lot that had a home on it once again was that done in secret because the idea was that oh if they know I'm purchasing a lot that has a home on it then they're going to stop building this other home right. which well, to me would make sense because it's like well now you got a home right and 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 so there's a couple of things there number one they said that they they never did live in that home on the lot that they bought they bought it and he he remodeled it and sold it to his nephew the plan was going to be that he was going to give that to his father to live in, and then he was going to live next door to him in the house that Jago, Jago built. But all that fell through when all the crap hit the fan with the right. marriage and stuff like now, that. Now, had he already sold the house and everything to his nephew? No, no, ultimate? no, that was later. Okay. My guys are out in left field as to that. They, they didn't know about that house until... I'll tell you when they find that out. Okay. And they didn't know that he had bought another lot out there. There was another lot out there. June comes around. He's, hey, I'm leaving. So they head to um, another area of Kentucky, E-Town, Kentucky. Lived there for a while. The last thing that our people had said to him is, find a lot. The deal's still on. June, July, August, September go by, and my people don't hear from him at all. September 2014 uh, rolls around. They do hear from him, and it's basically, hey, did you guys find me a lot? My guys were like, what do you mean, did we find you a lot? You know, we, we said that if we saw it, heard of anything or saw, my, my guys build in developments. They, they create developments. They right. also will build on scattered lots, but they don't own scattered lots. Okay, right. so if you found a lot that you wanted them to build a house on, you could come hire them, and they'd go out to your lot as long as you're in their service area. But you have to purchase you the lot purchase as the lot. homeowner, but right. they build on They'll the build lot, on your lot that you purchased. Gotcha. If you're not building in one of their subdivisions, that's the deal. Right. Okay. And that was why that was a part of the deal from the beginning was you got to have a lot. He comes back and said, well, did you all find me a lot? And we're like, we didn't tell you we were looking for a lot. We said if we saw anything, that may, we'd let you know. But we're not. That's not our business. Yeah. You know? So he's like, well, I don't. Okay. So that was September of 2014. Shortly after that phone call, one of my clients is at Menards here in Owensboro. And he bumps into the initial guy that got him involved in this. And that was the pastor of Mr. Watson's church, the drywall guy. Right. And he was like. Hey, I am so sorry I got you guys into this. He goes, you know, it's a bad scene in Muhlenberg County. Nobody's, I mean, the the the, the donations have dried up. And there's nobody doing anything. He's like, you know, uh, they were like, he he bought this other house and he tried to he's flipped it and and you know his daughter's not living with him and just goes down this whole long list of stuff. And my guy's like, oh really? Wow. The eleven year old daughter? Yeah. Who's she living with at this point? <clears throat> <clears throat> it was never clear who she was living with at that point. I mean, she did live with Watson and Alicia at some point, but I think she was in and out. So what happens then is it's we're up to September of 2014. My guy gets all this bad information about stuff that he had no idea, you know, and he goes back and tells his brother, and they're like, well, let's just see. September goes by, November, uh, September, October, November, December, January, February, March. So seven months go by, they don't hear from him. So they're just assuming he's gone. Right. right. He's gone. And despite all this new information that looks bad, they're still willing to help. But they didn't call him. They did not call him. when they. But remind, re, you got to remember, from June to September, they only heard from him one time. Right. And it was, Chad, you got to find a lot. Gotcha. That's what they told him. Right. You've got to find right. a lot. But what I'm saying is that despite all this, they're still willing they're to help this guy. They're still willing to help. And right. so then September, from September to March rolls around, and he shows up in March. And when he shows up in March, he says, hey, I've found a lot in Henderson. And they're like, well, one of the people that work for my company, they, or my client, said, well, send me the information. Well, it wasn't a lot. It was like six lots. And he hadn't picked one out. He just wanted us to go look at it. So we set up an appointment, and literally hours after we set up that appointment, he sends another text saying, oh, what about this one in Davis County? Okay, so he's, like, bouncing around. Yeah. So the the, the representative of the company that was doing that texting tells the brothers, he's like, what am I supposed to do? He's what, I'm, And they're like, don't go meet him. We're going to call him. So they call him, and they say, deal's off. Okay, and when they call him and tell him the deal's off, uh, the testimony in the case was that he said, "Well, then I'm just going to have to go to the news 
I'm going to have to go to the media about this. And uh, he didn't initially go to the media, but he went and hired a lawyer. Uh, and three days later, that lawyer was writing the company a letter. So he hired an attorney within three days of the phone call. And shortly thereafter, a lawsuit was filed against him. Now let me give you the history of the lawsuit. Okay. The, the lawsuit was filed in Davis County Circuit Court. There were depositions of the parties taken, and then it was dismissed out of court. We filed a motion for summary judgment. The trial court said, yep, there's not an issue here. There's, there's not a contract. There's no promissory estoppel, and dismissed it. And one thing I need to say is the lawsuit against my client pled breach of contract, promissory estoppel, which is a, a legal claim, and then also claimed negligent infliction of emotional distress. All that got dismissed and went to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals said, well, the dismissal of the negligent infliction of emotional distress is proper. However, there may have been some evidence that there was enough to support a contract. You know, in a contract, you have to prove that you're getting something of value and I'm getting something of value. It's called consideration. And they said there could have been consideration because the building company, the construction company, got some press out of this, some good press, which has value. And so, therefore, right. it goes back and forth. And then they said, and you, there is some evidence that maybe Mr. Watson detrimentally relied upon Jago to his detriment. Nobody else was willing to help him. And therefore, now he's stuck without a house. Okay, so detrimental reliance, promissory estoppel. So he, they said, because there could be evidence of that, it needs to go back to the trial court, and they, you need to have a trial with the jury. So uh, then, it, by the time it came back, it was like 2018. We did a little bit more work. We took some updated depositions, and then, and then COVID hit. When, coming out of COVID, we got the case set for trial, and we were about ready to try the case in the fall of last year, and it got bumped because of a murder trial because criminal trials take precedent over civil trials. Right. So we got bumped to start the trial this summer. That's the essence of the case. We tried the case. There's some things that came up uh, that I, you know, there was evidence in the case that, that there was over $250,000 of cash donations to this guy from the people in Muhlenberg County with which he bought that house and lot with a significant portion of it. Right. He bought a new truck. He bought four wheeler. He bought a side by side razor. He took a trip to New York. He took a trip to Florida. He bought an engagement ring. He gave away to friends and, and family $70,000 in cash. <laughs> Our argument was twofold. Number one is that based on the evidence of when they said the contract happened, which was on February 25th, that the press had already gotten a hold of this from the early meeting that we had, not with him, but with his cousin, and that he didn't bring anything additional of value on the 25th to the company. In other words, what did he give the company? The company's going to do all this work. That's valuable to Mr. Watson, but what did right. Watson give Jago that had any value that they didn't already have? They, he, they didn't come forward with anything new. That was the argument. Uh, we argued essentially it was a gift, and the thing that's beautiful about gifts is – that you give them not wanting anything back. Uh, there was evidence that Jago did nothing on their own to publicize this. They didn't put it on any social media. They didn't put any press release out. They didn't put it on their uh, on their website. They told their pub, their their marketing people absolutely don't do anything. This is not about us. This is just we're you know. So that was all the evidence. And, and then we argued that there was no way that Mr. Watson detrimentally relied upon the company to build the house because the only other offer to build the house was gone by the time he got out of the hospital. And that he could have avoided the injustice of not getting the house by using his money to buy or live in the house that he bought, right. buy a lot that would have been suitable during the time, or let us finish the house on the lot where we said we were going to build it. Right. So he could have avoided it three ways by telling us a little bit more information that he never told us. That was the argument. Um, it went to uh, uh, the jury on Monday, um, and... The jury reached a verdict that there was uh, no contract and reached a verdict that um, there was no promissory estoppel. And therefore, you know, the company was relieved of the legal obligation of building a home. 
um, they it, they were not suing for specific performance, which means we, as a part of meeting with, with Mr. Watson in those first few meetings they had with him, once they finally met him, they printed out some house plans right. with uh, like an estimate. Atta- and the reason there's an estimate attached to it is so they know how many windows, you know, what kind of countertops, what kind of cabinets and that kind of stuff. And that had a number built into it based on their computer software. And it was $267,000. Oh, wow. And so they they grabbed onto that number as being the con, the number that the that the house was worth it really wasn't but that's what they argued you know and so they sued him for two, sued, sued us for $267,550 plus interest and um <laughs> but the jury of course yeah that was it so two things number one is the trial order and judgment will be entered probably today it was sent over to the court where they sign off on the jury's verdict and then the, the other side has a chance to appeal. And if they appeal, you know, that's why I've been very careful here on the podcast to give only a recitation that the public knows about because it's public record. And right. My guys uh, were honorable through the whole thing, our clients. Um, it was, and, and it was a well tried case. Uh, Tim Harvey was the attorney for the Watsons, and he did a good job. He had a tough case to try. But he also had um, a, a very simple, from the standpoint of there was an offer, there was an acceptance, and you need to deliver. You never backed out. But when we did back out, of course, it caused a lawsuit. When it started hitting uh, the media and, and all that, uh, especially recently, knowing that I work here, people were asking me questions constantly. But I had to tell them, I'm like, I, I don't know anything. I'm not privy to any of the details. I don't know exactly what it is. I would even say I don't even know exactly how we're involved. <laughs> right. Cause, and I didn't ask any questions because, I mean, I, I knew at some point we would end up talking about it. But, I mean, I was getting questioned all the time by people like, so what's going on with this and what's happening here? And I'd be like, I, I don't even, I don't even, to, to be entirely honest with you, I didn't know any of those details. I'd say 90% of the details you just gave me as to right. what the case was about. I had no idea. And I work here. Well, we kept very careful control of what the press heard from our end yeah. through the whole thing. We, uh, I had, I guess a handful of opportunities to speak to the media and basically would say, look, the Jagos trust the, the justice system the case is going to be tried. We're not going to give you any insight as to why we think we're going to, you know, uh, because, and cause we don't want to seem like we're influencing potential jurors through the media. And so we just kept it very, almost nothing, you know? Yeah. What was funny was, is, all through the the media that when it, when it, when the first case first came up and then through some of the early court stuff they had the parties right like they knew I represented the construction company and but then this one that hits like a week before trial it said you know Travis Holtry attorney for for Chad Watson <laughs> and so I immediately had to send out a I put you know on our social media for us and then notified the newspapers like you got that wrong I don't represent him. I represent the company, and we're ready for this trial. After the trial was over, we agreed to, that we would have something that would be handed to them that would not be able to be misquoted, you know. Uh, <laughs> right. And, and so we typed out like a, a press release. I typed it out and got it approved by the company, and then handed it to the reporter. It, it's an it's, I mean, it, over the last several days, I've probably gotten. I don't know, eight, 10, 12 phone calls just from people in the, not in Owensboro, but from the Muhlenberg County area thanking me and uh, just saying that they were glad that um, that was the outcome, you know? So it was an interesting process. It was an interesting case and one that got a lot of attention. Yeah. You know? Well, congratulations so, yeah. again. Well, I know you just hope it's done. I mean, not that, you know, if it gets appealed, it gets yeah. appealed, but I mean, not sitting here and hearing all this for the first time. And I know, somebody could easily say that I would have a biased opinion because I work for FWH. I consider myself more of like a juror than I do an attorney, even though I work for attorneys. But sitting here and listening to all of this, I feel like what was determined was correct because there's far too many things going on that just seemed seedy and underhanded. And, 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 and now as far as like him getting married, people love a good conspiracy and people love drama. You know, that's why they say sex and death sells because people just want to gravitate towards that. So I get people getting up in arms and automatically making that assumption. I can't say that the guy didn't wasn't so distraught. This other woman came along and through their 
uh, collective grief found a bond right that that brought them together very quickly and the guy may have been lost and didn't know what to do and was alone he just lost the majority of his family so he didn't want to go through that she was there for him so they found each other and then they got married well, and regardless it, of the joke i think it's important that you say that because what happened was my clients knew about the marriage like within a day or two of it my guy received a phone, our, our people received a phone call from mr watson and said look I got married. I kind of broke it as it. I broke it to him as a April Fool's joke, but we're married, and is that going to affect the deal? And so, you know, our guys were like, "No, it's not going to affect the deal." I mean, they internally they were not happy about it because they were concerned that when the news got out, right, it, it was going to look look bad, suspect, but, but, yeah. But they they also like what you said. You know, this guy's lost everything. And who, you know, emotionally, you're not thinking straight, right? So they stuck with him there. What happened was when the news broke on the 17th of April, the company started getting phone calls from people saying, hey, do you know X, Y, Z? And I thought it was very, uh, it came into evidence. In fact, there was an email from Jago's marketing director who testified at trial to you know the two brothers saying hey do you all know about this we got a phone call it was a very this person was adamant and very angry about blah 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 and the response was great the response and it came into evidence the response from the company was this we are not going to comment on the personal matters of this guy's life just like we don't comment on the personal matters in the over 6,000 people we've built homes for. That was exactly the right thing because in layman's terms, even pedophiles and serial killers have to have a house to live in, <laughs> well, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> they're, they're in that, they're in the business of building homes, not the business of getting Critiquing. involved in people's personal lives. Well, you may disagree with what this guy did. We're not getting into that. We have offered this guy a gift uh, at this point in time we're at that point in time, they were investing a lot of revenue down in Graham on this lot. They had sent their team down there. They were surveying it. They were doing all that. Right. They had pinned it. They'd, you know, so from their mind at that point, they didn't know Chad was going to back out and leave Muhlenberg County. So they, they were like, look, we're this far along. Let's just get this house built and be done with it. Right. right. Well then, then it just trickled out a lot worse because when they left because of the rumors, then all of a sudden Chad goes non-existent. And, um, well, the leaving too, and the buying of a lot with a the, house on it. Not yeah. I, See, I wondered about that. It was like, and I've never ever discussed this, but like, you know, you would think, Hey, I bought this house. I think we can make it work, but would you all be willing to just donate to refurbishing it? Or? For me, from a juror's point of view, the way I'm looking at it is you just got well over $200,000 because of the goodwill of average citizens donating money and you got ca over two hundred thousand dollars cash and then you spent that on something where there's already a house then you're buying another lot you're buying a brand new truck you're buying a side-by-side -side, you know Sorry. and no you're so right there i would immediately go okay then you don't need someone else to be why do you need two homes right now you're taking advantage of the system mm -hmm. that's what you're doing you know, I mean, it, it's great that you want to buy a house and flip it for somebody in your family. That's fine. But guess what? That's not what the money was donated for. Right. It was there to help you because you just went through a tragedy. It wasn't there for you to benefit a little bit on the side. And then the rest of it goes to help benefit extended members of your family. That's not what that's there for. So you did. You took advantage of. And you knew what you were doing because you you didn't say anything about didn't it. And, and here's the other thing that I'm curious about. This other lot that they purchased, aside from the lot that had the home and everything on it, what were what were the plans with that other lot? Well, there was a mixed explanation for it. The big thing was is that it was I think they were trying to get all that out there together. There was they had it, there was at one time it was one farm, then it got broken up, and it, and with they he was trying to get it all back to what was originally the big farm you see right i think that was the goal overriding goal but the thing is is 
you know, the whole issue is, is we needed a suitable lot, right? And why didn't you ever let us vet that other lot to see if it was a better lot, you know, and look right. at how to get power there. What it comes down to is uh, honesty. There was a lot of, you're exactly right. That's really what it comes down to. And, and, exactly. And our guys are going into this open-handed. Here's what we're going to do for you. And it just can continue to get complicated. And um, there was a great line by the attorney on the other side in his opening statement. He said, I, he, his, he, goes, he goes, you know, honestly, ladies and gentlemen, I just don't know how something could get so far off track. That was what he said. <laughs> right. And I agreed with him. I was like, you know, it did get off track. But I, I think I know the source of that. I and mean, he's sitting right next to you, you know. Well, at least nobody pooped in his bed. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. That's, <laughs> that would really be newsworthy. Uh um, anyhow, then if, if the case gets appealed, I'll let everybody I don't know. I don't know what the intentions of the other side are to appeal it. I, um, I'm not going to make any comments as to what are potentially appealable issues it's simply to protect the right. client. I don't um, know how you could turn that around because it, well, it, it all comes well, down to, to look for legal mistakes as opposed to factual interpretation. Yeah. So. But regardless, he doesn't need two houses. I don't care how you want to play it. Yeah. Well, I'm we need you on the jury. Um, <laughs> I'll be there. All right. Well, I'm gonna we're gonna shut this one down. Oh, hey, real quick, yeah. did you see where uh, they're trying to put those new gun laws into? Have you seen that? No, I haven't. Um, apparently, the Senate passed a bill. It's um, where they're gonna change the age of being able to buy certain firearms, especially like assault rifles, from uh, to be you have to be 21 to purchase them. They're also doing uh, they're making it to where you can't purchase magazines that hold. Uh, a lot of ammunition and they're they're creating like a buyback program for people that do own those kinds of guns and kind of kinds of magazines that go with the guns to where the government will purchase those from you i guess more than what you paid for it if you're willing to give that up and the whole idea is and a lot and a lot of what they had the 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 survivors of the rob elementary school Uh come in and, and talk to you know, the committees and things about their experiences. And that's kind of what, now there's still a lot that has to be done. Obviously. Yeah. I was really surprised that moving quickly. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, when you have an 11 year old girl come in and say, I had to cover my body with the blood of my dead friend to pretend like I was dead. So I wouldn't get killed. That kind of comes with yeah, a powerful right. punch, you know? Well, I hadn't seen any of that. Of course I've been out of the loop. Cause I, when, when you're in a trial like this, it's like you get, into this pigeonhole right. or in it. Um, but no, I haven't heard. So. Yeah. There's always going to be people that oppose that, mm-hmm. right? So I would be interested to know what these these people of opposition, and I'm not saying that all firearms should be no, gone. No, I know. You should, you should have access to firearms, uh-huh. you know, for protection. I don't think you need a bazooka because it's fun to go out and blow things up. Right. So right. that's my opinion. So Well, I know, I do know this. I know that one of my other cousins um, is an avid firearms guy. Right. And would probably be um, a very level-headed, point-counterpoint type person to talk to about that. Right. So maybe we'll just, you know, have the cousin's hotline type deal, to, you know, bring yeah. him in on the gun control topic. Yeah. To me, I think there's, there's a common ground that can be met. If you like to shoot machine guns, well, then there should be businesses like shooting ranges. And I know these places do exist where they will, they offer up certain types of guns that you can go out and fire, but you don't own those weapons. That's how it should be. I think, mm-hmm. I think that businesses like that should exist. If you want to go out and shoot all these kinds of guns because it's fun, mm-hmm. that's fine. But it's the people owning the guns where it becomes a problem because the individuals who want to cause the chaos and do the damage can get their hands on these guns because they're accessible through the owners of said weapons, regardless of what your intentions are of owning it or, or how responsible you may think you are. So I think people should have access to these guns to be able to have fun to shoot them, just not own them. I think that, to me, that's the compromise. But you know how that goes. All right. Well, <laughs> I, I do. I, I would like to hear, uh, you know, it would be interesting to have a civilized debate. Over Absolutely. The, without any weaponry available to uh, enforce either side. Right. Or uh, So uh, but we'll, maybe we'll, we'll set that up as well. The only weapon is our mouth. Hmm. That could be dangerous. It can be. All right. Well, this has been Law Light, brought to you by Foreman Watson Holtry, FWHlegal.com. We appreciate your time and and listening to us each week. If you ever need um, good legal counsel, give us a look at uh, FWHlegal.com and all of our platforms of social media. If you need bad legal counsel, go somewhere else. Until next time, (laughs) have a great one. This case should never have come to trial.
crime. I don't think it's fair to call my clients frauds. Because one time I turned into a dog and they helped me. Thank you. Your Honor, we would like to withdraw our plea of not guilty and enter a plea of guilty. This trial is a travesty. It's a travesty of a mockery, of a sham, of a mockery, of a travesty, of two mockeries, of a sham. If we are to have faith in justice, we need only to believe in ourselves. And the truth shall set you free! How do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? Oh, guilty, but with a real good excuse. Well, I think the truth will come forth. You can't handle the truth!